Emperor of China, Self-Portrait of Kang Si by Jonathan D. Spence. Another category in which I have gauged Kang Si's mind is that of the second part, ruling. This category is, historiographically, the one in which the overwhelming mass of sources are concentrated. Hundreds of documents were issued each week in the emperor's name. These imperial documents are themselves only the surface of the seas of paper that flowed through the complex bureaucracy of 17th century China. For the purposes of understanding this book, it is enough to be aware of the outlines of the governmental system. The central bureaucracy of Kangxi's China was composed of a metropolitan division based in Peking and a provincial division. The metropolitan division was supervised by from four to six grand secretaries and directed by the presidents and vice presidents of the six boards or ministries, the board of civil office, the Board of Revenue, the Board of Rights, which was in charge of the examination system and received foreign tribute missions, and the Boards of Punishments, War, and Public Works. Bureaucratic practice was checked by officials in the censorate. The Emperor also had a separate imperial bureaucracy for the administration of his palaces, bodyguards, and estates. This was composed mainly of Manchus, band servants, and eunuchs. The Metropolitan Division of the Bureaucracy processed and supervised the activities of the provincial officials. During most of Kangxi's reign, there were 18 provinces, each directed by a governor. The provinces being also grouped into six units, each controlled by a governor general. Each province was divided into prefectures, Fu, and each prefecture was subdivided into counties, Shen, controlled by a magistrate, of whom there were some 1,500. The actual population of China at this time was about 150 million so by a rough average each magistrate had some 100,000 people in his charge these magistrates with their own sub bureaucracies at the local level were responsible for the collection of a total annual land tax of around 27 million ounces of silver tails in value this tax was collected from 90 million acres of agricultural land. The magistrates were responsible for local law and order, and they initiated that selection process of young scholars educated in the Confucian classics, which was a distinctive feature of the Chinese bureaucratic system. After satisfying local literary standards, students could embark on the national examination ladder. Those passing the official literary exams at the prefectural level were named licentiates. Those passing at the provincial level were called chojen. At 200 to 300 chojen who pass each triennial national exam were known as chen she and the cream of this went on to further study and literary work in the Hanlin Academy, the Imperial Center for Confucian Scholarship. Many Chu Zhen and most Chen She obtained prestigious and highly profitable office in the metropolitan or provincial bureaucracies. Ruling to Kangxi entailed ultimate responsibility for this entire economic and educational structure, and therefore for the life and death of all his subjects, as well as for the evaluation and molding of their characters. 
the most important influence on his theories of ruling was undoubtedly the terrible civil war known as the War of the Three Feudatories or San Fan War which broke out in 1673 and lasted for eight years. The three feudatory princes were Wu San Kui, Shang Che Shen, and King Xing Chong. In reward for the services they had rendered, the Manchu troops at the time of the overthrow of the Ming in 1644, they had been granted immense fiefs in southern and western China, which they ran as virtually independent princedoms. In 1673, after long debates with his council of princes and high officials, Kang Si decided to try to make Wu San Kui and the other two princes leave their fiefs and settle in Manchuria. This decision ran counter to the advice of the majority of his ministers and, as they had warned, precipitated a prolonged and destructive civil war which almost cost Kang Shi his throne. Although the rebels were completely destroyed by 1681, Kang Shi continued to brought about the civil war and his responsibility for it, and he often used it as an example of the difficulty of making correct decisions. The terrible suffering of the common people swept up in the war truly moved him, just as the dilatoriness of his own armies angered him. And after the war was over, he ordered harsh punishments for many of the rebel leaders. The penalties were, however, not arbitrarily imposed, but were in accordance with the legal code's provisions concerning treason. Kang Si's general concern with evaluating all cases involving the death penalty is a further reminder that justice in China was not a matter of whim. The code was sophisticated and provided a common structure of interpretation and precedent for the widely scattered members of the bureaucracy. Parallel bodies of regulations existed to give cohesion and uniformity to the vast tax-gathering apparatus, and in 1712, in announcing a freeze of the number of tax collection units, Teng, Kang Shi sought to set a firm standard for all future time as a proof of China's prosperity and a check on unnecessary governmental expenses.